we're gonna wrap this by getting all the good information. Love it. <laughs> Critical numbers, increase, decrease, relative max, relative min. Uh oh, I got that fast backwards. Let's see, there's some sort of setting here that I got to do. Video settings. Okay, let's try that. That's it. That's fun. Okay, we're going to wrap f of x is equal to x minus 3x to the one half, one third power, one third power. And I want to know where it has its critical numbers. Where it is increasing, where it's decreasing. I want to know if it has any relative max or relative min. I want to know where it's concave up and where it's concave down. And I didn't have room to put inflection points, that's why I chose those two instead. So take your first derivative. Notice that we've got a cube root function. Cube root functions are defined for all values of x. But when we take the derivative of this, we're going to have a denominator. So that's going to give us a place where the tangent line uh, is either going to be vertical or has a sharp corner, where the derivative fails to exist. So be on the lookout for that. All right, I got to push that camera which way? Maybe push the table back and the camera's going to go out. This is still stuff from section 4.5, maybe? So we learned about asymptotes, but there's also a piece in here about graphing things that have vertical and horizontal tangent lines. derivative, right? And I'm going to write that with positive exponents. Now let's think of this one as being x to the two-thirds over x to the two-thirds, so I could write that as a single fraction. So I think we get three critical numbers. I think 
We should get them where the confidence the kids doesn't see very well. Doesn't like chalk. Doesn't like much laundry in there. Maybe if we So when you set the top equal to zero, you get x to the two thirds is equal to one. And now we can get rid of this power by first raising everything to the third power. So now we get x squared is equal to one. And that means x can be plus or minus one. Then here, that's equal to zero. And x is zero. So just remember that here, f prime does not exist. Here, f prime is zero. So there's a horizontal tangent and there's possibly a vertical tangent. Possibly, we're not sure we'll find that out in a bit. So we'll find out right here. There's the negative one, there's the zero, there's the one, and we're looking at the sine of f prime. Okay, so let's see. This is a cube root, then squared. Cube root, then squared. So I'm gonna pick a number I can take the cube root of, like maybe a negative eight. Cube root of negative eight is negative two, negative two squared is four, minus one is positive. And the denominator is always positive because at the end it's squared. So I have a positive over a positive. And then here I'm gonna take say a negative one eighth as my test point. So that I to get the cube root of negative one eighth and I get a negative one half. Squared is one fourth, minus one is negative. Negative over positive is negative. This should mirror that because it's an even power. It should be symmetric. So I use a 1 8. Cube root of 1 8 is a half. Squared is a fourth minus 1 over a positive. So it's negative. And then put a positive 8 in there. And the same deal happens here. So we have a function <coughs> that is continuous everywhere. And it rises falls, keeps falling, and then rises again. So when I answer this part here, the critical numbers are 1, negative 1, and 0. Increasing to the left of negative 1, and then again to the right of positive 1. Decreases on both sides of zero, so from negative one to zero, and then again from zero to one. Do we have a relative max anywhere? Negative one. Relative max if x is negative one. What about a relative min? A positive one. All right, so now we need a second derivative, and I think it's easier to take the second derivative from here so that we don't have to do the quotient rule. The second derivative is 2 thirds x to the negative 5 thirds.
gives us 2 over 3x to the 5 thirds. So there's going to be a value of x that makes the second derivative not defined. And that always happens. If the first derivative is not defined at a point, neither is the second derivative. So x is equal to 0 is a possible inflection point. We need to check the sign of f double prime. Okay, and so this is an odd power. Both the numerator and denominator are odd. So a negative number to an odd power stays negative. So this is negative over here and positive over here. And so the graph is concave down to the left of zero and concave up to the right of zero. Concave up on zero to infinity, concave down on minus infinity to zero, and oh, by the way, x is equal to zero is the inflection point. So we're going to plot x is zero, one, and negative one, and then try to follow the arrows and then adjust the concavity. So let's plot the points right in here. Alpha zero is going to be zero. Alpha one is one minus three is a negative two. And f of negative one. Negative one, cube root of negative one is negative one, times three is a positive three, plus this minus one is a positive two. So, with my old school eraser, <laughs> all right, so here's the graph. Oops, I'm going to go back a little bit. Let's see, I got zero, zero with a possible vertical tangent line. I've got uh, one, two, and negative one, negative, negative one, positive two. And the tangent line there is horizontal. One, negative two. The tangent line there is horizontal. Let's draw with some dotted lines the path up, down until it hits one again, and then up. And then it has to be concave down here, concave up here, but in such a way that there is no derivative. So that means the graph has to get nearly vertical right there, make it real tight around x is zero. So kind of follow the vertical tangent, make it go like that. We've got a vertical tangent line right here. Okay. Now it's going to be a sharp point if the concavity doesn't change on each side. So I think I have one of those for you to try. Same stuff. Let's see, f of x equals, I can't see that. x to the 5 thirds plus 5x to the 2 thirds. So we have a 5 thirds and a 2 thirds. Those are both cube roots. So they're defined everywhere. But it'll, we're going to have a, a, a zero in the denominator when we do that derivative. Okay. 
kind of mimic what I did before. Take the derivative, write it with positive exponents, and then write it as a single fraction, and then see if you can find your critical numbers. See how many there's going to be. This crazy thing's not staying up. When my boys were young and I used to teach in this building, they'd play outside while I taught class, and every now and then I'd go out and check it. Maybe they were breaking into any cars and come back here to do my class. And I also taught a class over there in the foreign language building, which was next to the barn, and I couldn't see them. They would play outside, then I had a classroom that couldn't see that area. But I told them the barn was haunted, you can't go in there. They went in there all the time because I told them the barn was haunted. They're looking for ghosts and critters and stuff. I think nowadays I'd get arrested for letting my children run around unattended. <laughs> Have they got any critical numbers? Maybe there should only be two critical numbers here. You can even have a plus sign in between. I don't think anybody gets plus points for this for any reason. Let's see if I can show you why. Why can't I stick to the two words over the world? You can get a point in my view. Okay. Oh, so there's only one critical number. Only one critical number at x is zero? Because of the plus sign, let's take the derivative. We get 10 thirds x to the 2 thirds plus 10 thirds x to the negative 1 third. Right? That x to the negative 1 third is going to be down there on the bottom with the 3. Actually, I'll pull out the 10 thirds, just get it out of the way. Like that. Then we're going to get a common denominator inside of x to the 1 third. And so when I multiply this by x to the 1 third over x to the 1 third, oh no, we'll get two critical numbers. Right, because x to the one third times x to the two thirds is x to the three thirds. So that's x to the first power plus one all over x to the one third. So we get two critical numbers where the top is zero, it, x is negative one, and where the bottom is zero at x is zero. We can note that at x is equal to zero, f prime does not exist. So that's either a vertical tangent like in the last example or a sharp corner. So now we'll check the sign of the derivative around those two numbers. Let's 
So when I say they were zero and negative one, so let's put negative one here and zero. If I put a negative two on top, that's negative. That's a cube root, and a cube root of a negative is negative. So in this interval, I got a negative divided by a negative. If I put, say, a negative one half in there, the numerator is positive, but the denominator is negative. So the overall sign is negative. And if I put a one in for x, both the top and the bottom are positive. So the graph is going to rise, fall, rise. It increases to the left of negative one. And then again, from zero to infinity. It decreases between negative one and zero. So our maximum is over there at x is negative one, and our minimum is at x is zero. Now let's get a second derivative, but let's go to before we simplify. Let's take the second derivative from here. So let's see, 10 thirds times 2 thirds is 20 over 9. And then I'm going to have an x to the negative 1 third. 10 thirds times 1 third is 10 over 9, and it will be negative. What's my new power on the x? Negative 4 thirds. So, so, I've got another common factor of 10 over 9. I'm going to pull that out. I'm going to put the negative power terms on the bottom and make the powers positive. So I'm pulling out a 10 over 9. That leaves me a 2 here over x to the 1 third. I pulled that out, so that leaves me a 1 over x to the 4 thirds. So the bigger of the two denominators will give me the common denominator. That will be the x to the 4 thirds. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by x to the 4 thirds. Now I can write my derivative as a single fraction. As 10 over 9 times 2x to the 4 thirds minus 1. Why don't we just multiply by x? Oh, yeah. Duh. We're just going to multiply by x. You get the x to the 4 thirds. Good catch. All right, so that gives me 2x minus 1 over x to the 4 thirds. And we have two inflection points then. We have an inflection point where the numerator is 0. So 2x minus 1 is 0 when x is equal to 1 over 2. And then again, at x is 0. of the second derivative. One half is zero. A four thirds is an even power. It's a cube root of the number raised to the fourth power. So no matter what I put in for x in the denominator, it's always going to be positive. So let's just worry about the numerator. If I put a negative 1 in there, 2 times negative 1 minus 1 is negative. 
If I put a negative one fourth in there, I have a negative one half minus one is negative. And if I put a positive one in there, it's positive. Because it's from zero to one. Oh, yeah, you're right. Still, it's going to be a negative, right? Two times a fourth is a half. Mm -hmm. Minus one is negative. So we've got concave down, concave down, concave up. So it's concave up to the right of the half and concave down to the left and right of zero. Minus infinity to zero, union zero to one half. Our critical numbers were negative one and zero. F of zero is gonna be zero. F of negative one, that's an odd power. So I'm gonna get negative one out of here. Times two is negative two. That's an even power. So when I put negative one in here, I'm gonna get one. So two plus five gives me three. So it goes through zero, zero and Negative one, three. I'm not going to plot the one half. We'll take that. So there's zero, zero, negative one, three. At zero is where we had no derivative. So let's put a mark there that we have no derivative. And here we have the horizontal tangent line. Draw your graph to do this, up, down, up. So up, down, up, in such a way that it's concave down here. Let's put a half about right here. It's gonna be concave down in this little piece and then concave up here. So to the left of zero, it's kind of easy to draw that all concave down like that. Now this little piece right here has to be concave down and that's gonna show us the sharp corner at the no derivative spot at zero. And now turn it around and make it concave up but follow the dotted line. That's pretty snazzy little graph. We could never have gotten all those features in there just by plotting points, or we probably couldn't even catch all of that if we graphed it on a calculator. Unless we really zoomed out on it. Zoomed in on it, which one would we zoom in? So I wanted to show you these types of examples. You're gonna get some sort of funky place when you've got fractional exponents. Cube roots are the ones that are the either vertical tangents or cuspy ones, but fifth roots will probably do the same kind of deal. Okay? It's all good? Okay. So on to section four or five. I send you a worksheet on your email? That's what we're going to go through here today. I said this was from four or five, I was wrong, this was four four. Something called Lopetal's rule. And it's a rule that tells us how to find limits that are either of the form zero over zero or infinity over infinity. So they deal with the types of limits we were taking when we were looking for horizontal asymptotes, but also way back at the beginning in chapter two, when we'd plug the number in, we'd get something like zero over zero. 
and you had to do something else like factor, rationalize, um, get a common denominator, all that stuff. Now our other something else would be to employ L'Hopital's rule. So we're looking at functions of the form, say f of x over g of x. And we're going to take the limit as x goes to some number, or it could be as x goes to infinity, doesn't matter. And we're going to operate with the assumption that when you plug that number in for x, you have either 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. Now, you know we can write a linear approximation to a function near x is a by writing the equation of the tangent line near x is a. So we're going to assume that both f of a and g of a are 0. So I write the linearization of each of these two functions. I write the equation of the tangent line to x is equal to a. And I have f of x is equal to f prime at a times x minus a plus f of a. I forgot my plus f of a, so I have to put it out here at the end. And then I can do the same thing with g of x. The equation of its tangent line has a g prime of a times x minus a plus g of a. So I look at the linear approximation and I want to see what's happening there. And what I see is that these two terms are zero. And then once those are gone, the x minus a's can cancel. And here's L'Hopital's rule. this limit has the form of 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, take the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. Whatever limit you get here will be the same as the limit that is over there. So if this limit is equal to L, then the limit as x goes to a of f of x over g of x is also L. So L'Hopital's rule applies to the forms 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. Remember our special limit from chapter two? Say the limit as x goes to zero of the sine of 3x divided by 2x. I just had you memorize that special limit. What was it? It'll be 3 over 2, right? And I said, that's just because. And there's a valid reasoning with some trigonometry. But now we can verify that with L'Hopital's rule. It does have the form of 0 over 0. So we just take the derivative of the top, derivative of the bottom, and then try to take the limit. So I'm going to write that I checked L'Hopital's rule. It's got the form of 0 over 0 right here. So the derivative of the sine of 3x is the cosine of 3x times the 3. And I'll put the 3 out here. And the derivative of 2x is just 2. Now when you plug 0 in for x, I get the cosine of 0, which is 1, times 3 divided by 2. And there it is really handy. All of those limits that we did earlier, where we had to do a lot of factoring and canceling, all of those that we did back in chapter two that have the form of zero over zero, we can do now with L'Hopital's rule. Remember I had you do one where you had to do long division.
or even synthetic division. Remember doing that problem? When x is 1, a numerator is 0, the bottom is 0. We did synthetic division and got this big old long thing as the quotient term, and then we were able to plug the 1 in. We'll do L'Hopital's rule now and see how quick it is. Done, right? The derivative on the top is 10x to the ninth. The derivative on the bottom is 1. So first I tell myself I have 0 is 0. Then I'm going to take that derivative of the top, divide by the derivative of the bottom. Now I can put the 1 in for x. And there's our limit. Isn't that sweet? Okay, well, let's whip out that handout and go through those problems then. Do I have that handout? Nobody has it but me. Maybe. Maybe. I'll pull it up on Blackboard. Oops, there's some papers I should have graded. <laughs>
you guys get all registered for your classes for next semester? Did you watch, did you watch Wander? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm like, oh, 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 no, no, but I did, I requested for a phone. laughing as you were I reading. asked her all these other questions questions and she's like um I don't know you have to talk to this person I don't know you have to talk That's to this person literally um, for the pre-med stuff I was like this was a yeah. waste of my time like, well the pre-med stuff I don't know either because it varies from school to school where you want to go to medical school I knew most of that but I asked her like well can I register for this now even though I'm taking this over the summer and she's like I don't know Again, that's a department by department oh, thing. Okay. Like it's it, stressful. She gave you like thirteen numbers. <laughs> right, because it is. If you if you try to do it for English, they're going to say nope. We've got to see your grade first. Uh -huh. If you try to do it for Spanish, they do the same thing. For me, I'll usually if somebody says I need, I'm registering for Cal two, and I'll go and while they're talking to me, I'll look at their ACT scores, and if it's a certain score, I'll say nope. I got to see your Cal one grade first. <laughs> But if it's a real good score, I say, okay, I'll give you the permit. So that's because we take a chance. I had this one student that as a freshman failed all her courses and yet enrolled in the subsequent courses that they were prereqs for because she was able to pre-register while she was enrolled. It didn't dawn on her yeah. that because she failed Cal 1, she doesn't have a chance in Hades of passing Cal 2. Mm -hmm. She just kept on going. And she did this for like several semesters. And I look at her. You have no math credits, and it's been three semesters. <laughs> so we got to be real careful because there are people out there that we think I don't need to tell them this. <laughs> what you do? What you do? I'm nervous about statistics because they haven't assigned a professor to it, and they're like, I'm like, please don't give me the professor I already hates. Like I had to take that one, so I'm like, oh. well, our people in statistics are pretty good. Yeah. Just remember, add them all up, divide by how many you have. Honestly, yeah. Pretty much. You learn, like, you just learn all the stuff in the calculator, and you really don't have to memorize any of the equations. Like, well, they let you use formula sheets. Oh, well, I didn't get a formula sheet. I just wanted to write the stuff in the equation. Well, why did you take it? I don't want the prerequisite for, for engineering. Yeah, yeah. it's prerequisite. It's a weed out. Like, I'm Are mechanical. you computer science? I'm mechanical engineering. I don't need chemistry. Yeah, you do. I do. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. You definitely need chemistry. Yeah, I need chemistry. No, right. I have you know, like my professor. I wish I Cassie, you're lucky. You get to take math. I'm, I'm fine with that. I want you to be more than fine with that. Can you act a little bit more enthused? I will literally take all math classes. Thank you. Okay, let's go on the worksheet, and we're going to try to take these limits. We make sure first it has the right form. The first one on the worksheet is the limit as x goes to zero. 
of the cosine of 2x minus 1 That's, I'm only taking the cosine of a 2x, and then the minus 1 comes afterward. And then it's over 3x squared. So before you dive into L'Hopital's rule, make sure it's applicable. You plug the 0 in for x. 2 times 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. And then you put the zero in here and you get zero. So L'Hopital's rule does apply. L'Hopital's rule is the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. So we're taking the derivative of the cosine of 2x minus 1. I'll help. The derivative of the minus 1 on the end is zero. What's the derivative of the cosine of 2x? Negative sine of 2x times the 2. And we'll put the 2 in front. And then the derivative of the bottom is 6x. So what happens here if you try to put 0 in for x? And on top. So you got another 0 over 0. Good news. L'Hopital's rule still applies. You can do it as long as it's in that indeterminate form. So you tell yourself you still have the indeterminate form and you do it again. Take the derivative of the top, divide by the derivative of the bottom. All right, again, I'm helping. The derivative of the bottom is six. <laughs> and now it's your turn. What's the derivative of the top? Negative 4 cosine 2x, cosine. negative 4 cosine 2x. This is a constant, the derivative of sine is cosine, then we get another 2 from in here. So negative 4 cosine of 2x. So now I know it doesn't have the 0 over 0 form because there's a 6 on the bottom. You put a 0 in for x and you get the cosine of 0, which is 1. And so you're left with negative 4 over 6. That's it. All right, next one. We have 4 tangent of x divided by 1 plus secant of x. And we are going to pi halves. From the left. Tangent is sine over cosine, secant is 1 over cosine, and guess what the cosine of pi halves is? It's 0. So if you're dividing by 0, that makes that expression infinite. So this looks like infinity, and so does that. Take the derivative of the top and divide it by the derivative of the bottom and see what you get there. Tangent. And the derivative of 1 plus the secant of x. And so I can cancel one of the secants on top with one of the secants on the bottom. And 
Now leave me a secret to the first power on top and a tangent on the bottom. Front row. That almost looks like what we started with. Except for it's upside down, but it still has a secant and a tangent, both of which are undefined at pi halves. So it still has the form of infinity over infinity. Shall we try Lopatel's rule again? Why not? Except when I take the derivative of the secant on top, I get 4 secant x tangent of x. And when I take the derivative of the tangent on the bottom, I get secant squared of x. So we're kind of in an infinite loop here, aren't we? So I suggest we stop this L'Hopital's rule stuff and try something else. We can try something else from this step. What's your suggestion? I'm going to rewrite this up here. I have a 4 tangent of x over a secant of x. I'm not going to keep doing L'Hopital's rule because I'm going to keep flip floppings, putting secants and tangents in numerator and denominator. So how about we go to sines and cosines? Tangent is sine over cosine, secant is 1 over cosine. If we keep simplifying, dividing by this puts it up here upside down. That makes the cosines cancel. And now we can take the limit as x goes to pi halves of 4 times the sine of x. What's the sine of pi halves? 1. So this limit is 4. So L'Hopital's rule is nice for a second, but you still have to resort to some of your uh, trickery when it gives you this type of situation here. It's not the be all end all, but it's pretty dang nice and handy. Okay? All right, one more. We're going to take the limit as x goes to infinity of the natural log of x divided by the square root of x. So the natural log of x is a growing function, the square root of x is growing. So this behaves like infinity over infinity, which is the other case that L'Hopital's rule will work for us. So we take the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. Who remembers the derivative of the natural log of x? 1 over x. Do you have the derivative of the square root of x memorized, or do I need to write that as x to the 1 half and go through the power rule? 1 over 2 squared of x. So let's do the flip and multiply step and see how that simplifies. That cancels. I got the lower power on top. So it's going to leave me a 2 over the square root of x on the bottom. What happens to that as x goes to infinity? Mm -hmm. 
is real small, right? How small can it get? What did we say a number divided by infinity was? Zero. This one is zero. Any number divided by something infinitely large is zero. Okay, so those are the indeterminate forms zero over zero or infinity over infinity. We have other indeterminate forms, and our other indeterminate forms are zero times infinity, infinity minus infinity, indeterminate forms, zero times infinity, infinity minus infinity. Here we have to do a little algebra. Do algebra to get it into either zero over zero or infinity over infinity. And then we have exponential indeterminate forms. One to the infinity, um, zero to the infinity, or infinity to the zero power. Those are all indeterminate forms, and they are all going to involve not just algebra, but we're going to use a logarithm. The logarithm has a property of pulling powers down, and that will get these things maybe into one of those forms. So let's look at number four. We have x goes to zero from the right of x squared times the natural log of x. So I know what happens to the x as x goes to zero. What about the natural log of x? What's it look like near x is zero, but on the right hand side is zero? Got a picture of the logarithm in your head? No? What does the graph of this look like? Log of x. It's got a vertical asymptote at x is zero, right? So as x is coming to zero from the right, this is going to minus infinity. And this is going to zero. So zero times infinity, zero times minus infinity, the sign doesn't matter. It's an indeterminate form. And I'm going to make this look like, uh, I think, infinity over infinity by doing this. And you can tell me why I can do this. Why am I allowed to do that? I took that x squared that's multiplied in front and I rewrote it as a one over x squared in the denominator. That's the same thing because if you're dividing by a fraction, you can flip and multiply. So I just did that activity backwards. But now I've got an infinity on top, and then as x goes to 0, 1 over 0 becomes infinitely large. So now it has the right form for L'Hopital's rule. It has infinity over infinity. So take the derivative of the top, divided by the derivative of the bottom. Helps 1 over x squared is x to the negative 2. Use the power rule there.
So here we go. The derivative of the natural log of x gives me a 1 over x on top. When I'm taking the derivative of x to the negative 2, I get negative 2 x to the negative 3. Which I can write as negative 2 over x cubed. Now let's simplify by doing the flip and multiply step. So that x that I have on the bottom now cancels into the x cube. And I take the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared over negative 2. You can do that just by putting 0 in for x. And I get 0 over negative 2, which is big fat old 0. Okay, so that's a typical step. You take one of the factors in the form of 0 times infinity and put its reciprocal in the denominator so that it now has one of our L'Hopital forms. And do L'Hopital's rule, and we get a limit. So let me do a similar one. The next one we have the limit is x goes to pi halves of 2x minus pi times the secant of x. Coming in from the right or the left, secant pi halves is not defined. It doesn't matter whether we come from the right or left. Secant of pi halves is 1 over cosine of pi halves. Cosine of pi halves is 0. So 1 over 0 is infinitely large. So the secant of pi halves is infinity, but when you put x uh, pi halves in for x on top, I get 0. So that's the same form as the last problem, 0 times infinity. But in the last problem, we took the polynomial part and put its reciprocal on the bottom. I think with trig functions, it's easier just to write this as 1 over cosine, and you automatically have a, a bottom. So I'm going to write it like this. Right, secant is 1 over cosine. And so when I multiply by 1 over cosine, I get the cosine on the bottom. So now it has the form of 0 on top. Cosine of pi halves is also 0. So from there, you can do L'Hopital's rule. Masks today. Never use it again. Derivative of top is 2, the derivative of the bottom is sine of x, and then we're going to let x go to pi halves. What's the sine of pi halves? One. Our final limit is 2. if we had had that problem back in chapter two. Yeah. Must cosine is minus sign? Do I get partial credit? <laughs> we couldn't have done that problem back in chapter two, right? Because there's no algebra that puts us in the right form. We would have had to go and maybe plotted points on the calculator. But now we can just do it with the local tells them. Okay. Yes. How do you determine that sine of x, like, or a sine of two pi, I guess, would be sine of pi halves? Oh yeah. Like, why? How come that's like two infinity? 
This like the right secant right. is one over cosine. Yeah. Cosine of pi has is zero. All right, so if I take one and divide it by something teeny, teeny, tiny, it gets really, really big. Or you can think of the graph of the secant of x. Let's see, here's the graph of the cosine of x, where this is pi halves. So the secant looks like this. Those are asymptotes. Let me do it in pink. The secant of x is going to be in pink. So here's pi halves. So that's why I said we need a one-sided limit. If I'm coming in from the left, it's going to plus infinity. If I'm coming in from the right, it's going to minus infinity. So I probably should have had a, a, a designation here. So I'm hoping the next example shows the infinity minus infinity. No, it does not. Let's go and jump to number eight. Number eight shows the infinity minus infinity. We got the limit as x goes to one. Of one over x minus one minus 1 over the natural log of x. So in both of these cases, when x is 1, and we should probably be 1 from the right, that doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um, with either case, when x is 1, the denominators are 0. And as before, 1 divided by 0 gets very, very large. So this looks like infinity minus infinity. Hopital's rule doesn't apply. We have to make it into an infinity over infinity or zero over zero. So the most logical thing to do is to get this as a single fraction, where the common denominator is the product of these two. So I'm going to multiply this by the natural log of x over the natural log of x. I'm going to multiply this by x minus 1 over x minus 1. So let's write this as a single fraction. Multiply that by log of x. Multiply that by x minus 1. Now they have the common denominator. I put them together as a single fraction all at once. So now my numerator is 0, and so is my denominator. And zero over zero. Everybody agree with that? When x is one, natural log of one is zero. One minus one is zero. Zero minus zero is zero. On the bottom, I have zero times zero. So I have the form zero over zero. You got to do L'Hopital's rule. Make sure you do the product rule on the bottom. Where the natural log of x is 1 over x, 
And here the derivative of x minus 1 is just 1. Product rule, I've got the first times the derivative of the second, but the derivative of the second is just 1, plus the second times the derivative of the first. I don't want to take the limit yet. Let's clean it up a little bit. I don't like having those 1 over x's there. How about we multiply top and bottom by x to get rid of the 1 over x's? Just multiply that by x. Multiply all of that by x. And so when I distribute the x here, I get a 1 minus x on top. Now here I get to start the x all the way back here, so I get x ln x, and then the second term cancels the x's, so I just get plus x minus 1. See where I got all that? This x multiplied here gives me x ln x. This x times that cancels, so it just leaves me with x minus 1. So take a look at what happens when x becomes 1. What happens? Anything good? It's not bad, though, is it? What's the point? Still 0 over 0. But that's OK. 0 over 0 is good. Do it again. Do L'Hopital's rule again. Tell yourself you notice that it's still 0 over 0. You love to call rule again. It'll be the last time we have to do it, because look, I get a 1, negative 1 on top. Maybe. Yeah, a little product rule action down there on the bottom, but we'll be OK. Where? Um, the top is going to be 1 minus x. You see why? Okay, so here comes the product rule on the x times the natural log of x. So here's the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. And in here, the derivative of x minus 1 is 1. And so this one adds to that one to give me 2. Now, as x goes to 1, the natural log of 1 is 0. So that's 0. There's our limit, negative 1 half. Okay? So you can do L'Hopital's rule as many iterations as you need, as long as you're aware that you're not in an infinite loop like with that tangent secant problem. And that's typically how we handle the infinity minus infinity case. We write a single fraction. Here we wrote a single fraction by getting a common denominator. But if you remember those cases back in chapter two, there were also those where we had to rationalize by multiplying by the conjugate, top and bottom. Okay. All right, so now let's back up and look at the exponential indeterminate forms. So the first one we see is number six. The limit is x goes to 0 of 1 plus 3x all raised to the 1 over 2x. Now 
So there were three indeterminate forms of the exponential type, one to the infinity, infinity to the zero, and zero to the infinity. Those are all indeterminate forms. Which form does this one have as x goes to zero? One to the infinity. One over zero becomes infinitely large, and then this goes to one. So we're going to try to use a logarithm, but before we do that, I'm going to make this into an equation. I'm going to pretend I know what the limit is, and I'm going to call it L. And now I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. Remember, limits can slide inside and outside of rules. So I can go ahead and put the logarithm here and put the logarithm there. Use the natural logarithm. And the reason we're doing that is that log property. The natural log of anything to a power is that power times the log of the base. So that takes it out of exponential form. I can take this 1 over 2x and pull it down in front of the logarithm. I know that I'm going to try to use L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule requires a fraction. So instead of writing it as 1 over 2x times that, let's multiply it and put that 2x on the bottom of the logarithm. So we took it out of the exponential indeterminate form. What kind of indeterminate form does it have now? Zero over zero. Good news. Zero over zero. Do L'Hopital's rule. Take the derivative of the top, derivative of the bottom. Remember that the derivative of log of u is 1 over u times u prime. You live it. One over u, so one over one plus three x. Now we go inside the derivative of one plus three x will give me a three. I'm just gonna put it right up here. Downstairs, the derivative of that is two. So I go ahead and put zero in for x. zero, this term's gone. The numerator simplifies to three. The denominator is two. So I get three halves is the natural log of L. How can I get L if I know what the natural log of L is? Who said it? Can't see your mouth move with mask on. Inverse it using what? It's the inverse of logarithm? E. So e to the three halves is our limit. That works on every single exponential indeterminate form. Like the next one. The next one is the limit is x goes to pi halves from the left of 1 plus the cosine of x raised to the tangent of x. The 
One side of pi has is zero. So the base acts like one. The tangent of pi has becomes infinite because the tangent is a sine over a cosine. So one over zero is going to become infinite. So it has the same form, one to the infinity. Let's do the exact same steps. Make an equation out of it by putting the limit L on the right hand side. Take the natural log of both sides so that you can bring the power down. Take this coefficient and write it in front of the logarithm. A big old T on the tangent. All right. So it's certainly not in the right form for me to use Lobotol's rule. What form does this one have? Infinity times zero. Infinity times zero. So I'll put a one over tangent on the bottom, maybe. What's one over tangent? Which trig function is that? Cotangent. So let's rewrite it as. To figure out the cotangent of pi halves, remember that the cotangent is cosine over sine. Cosine of pi halves is zero, sine of pi halves is one. So the cotangent of pi halves is zero. So it has the form zero over zero. This way I need to see if you remember how to take the derivative of a cotangent. Negative something something. Yes. We're still in calculus, but this is where we're going to be. You're welcome to come set because you might like some of these limits we're doing. They're doing the same kind of limits in Cal 2. This is Cal 1, right? This is where we learned the oh, yeah. indeterminate forms. Can we move this for next semester? And yeah. I need all my Cal 2 people in here. They got to watch this again. <laughs> okay, so the derivative at the top is 1 over u times u prime. So 1 over 1 plus the cosine of x. The derivative of cosine of x is a minus sine of x. All right, let's talk to the minus sign. Who's got the derivative of the cotangent? Cosecant squared. And all of that's equal to the natural log of L. The minus signs will cancel. And so, so let's simplify this a smidge. I'm going to have the sine of x over 1 plus the cosine of x cosecant squared. What's our identity for cosecant? Cosecant is 1 over sine. So this is 1 over sine squared.
So we'll do the flip and multiply step, and that's going to give us a sine cubed on top, right? Where did the minus sign go and the sine? I canceled them. Okay. Okay. So I can simplify my expression on the left as a sine cubed over the one plus cosine of x. And we're going to see what happens as x goes to pi halves. Remember that that's the natural log of the limit that we see. So sine of pi halves is 1. 1 cubed is 1. So the numerator is 1. Cosine of pi halves is 0. That makes the denominator 1. So I get 1 over 1 is my limit. Peel off the logarithm with an exponential function. So our limit is e to the first power. Now, I've spent all these examples showing you how really cool L'Hopital's rule is. I've got to give you an example where it just doesn't work. You've seen one where you got kind of circular with the trig functions. L'Hopital's rule also stinks out loud if I have a square root sign over my denominator or my denominator. Let's put the square root of x squared plus 9 on top. And let's put 4x plus 2 on the bottom. First, let me see if you can do this limit without L'Hopital's rule. By thinking how we did these in section 4.4. Four. What's the behavior of the highest power of x in the numerator? Well, square root of x squared. That's like x, right? The denominator, highest power of x is also x. So when the degree on top is equal to the degree on the bottom, we get the limit by plucking the coefficients. So this limit should be 1 fourth, right? Coefficient of the x squared here is 1, and the coefficient here is 4. So we should be able to eyeball that and get that limit as 1 fourth. But if we try to do L'Hopital's rule, it has the form of infinity over infinity. So we take the derivative of the top and divide it by the derivative of the bottom using the information that a square root sign is a one half power. So I start my power rule, I bring the power down, I raise this to one power less, and I multiply by the derivative of what's inside. Downstairs I just get a four. Now I simplify. A half of 2x is 1. Then this term with the negative power goes on the bottom. So I just have x over 4 times that square root. But if I take the limit there, I still have something that's infinite over something that's infinite. So it didn't take it out of L'Hopital's form. So I try again. Take the derivative of the top, divide it by the derivative of the bottom. And the top is easy enough. The derivative of the bottom with the chain rule again. Half of 4 gives me a 2. x squared plus 9 to the negative 1 half. And then a 2x on the bottom. Now take that term with the negative exponent, move it upstairs, and make the exponent positive. 
giving me with a 4x on the bottom and now a square root on the top. As I keep doing L'Hopital's rule, we got that flip flop in action that we had a second ago with the trig functions. It's always going to stay in the form of infinity over infinity. So it's not a good rule with square root signs, not a good rule with some of our trig functions. The tangents and the secants have derivatives which were each other. So L'Hopital's rule is not good with square roots. What's making this a problem is that I've got a high power of x on top. So that I always get the derivative inside to stay there. And then the derivative square root thing goes under and then vice versa. So it never takes us out of indeterminate form. Okay, so don't rely entirely on it. Um, but that did make me think of a web work problem. We had a web work problem that did something like this. And I said this limit was one fourth. What happens here when I make that a minus infinity? Is it still one fourth? The numerator still behaves like x, so does the denominator, and I just take the one over four. But there's a problem. The numerator really doesn't behave like x. The numerator behaves like the absolute value of x. So if this behaves like the absolute value of x, and this behaves like 4x, then I have a positive number over a negative number. So we're not going to get 1 fourth, we're going to get negative 1 fourth. So look out for that on your web work. We've got one of those on there. Well, it's the same expression. you got a square root of something squared. In one case, we're going to a positive infinity. In one case, we're going to a negative infinity. That's the only time where you don't just take the coefficients. you got to be aware that the square root of x squared is the definition of the absolute value. Okay, let's see if there's anything else I need to warn you about. Did that one. Did that one. I think we're good if you're good. Anybody need to ask anything? You had enough, huh? <laughs> Then you may exit the building. <laughs> this way, we have an exit this way. We're gonna try to come back here unless I can figure out that other that other room. It's kind of kind of like chalkboards though. I love them. Bye. 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 Thank you. And this is here. Thank you.